Happy week four, World Religions. You have made it almost halfway through the term. This week, we are working on Islam. So as with most weeks, you have two readings. Stephen Prothrow, which is chapter one this week, and an article called Formats, Fabrics, and Fashions from authors Unal and Moores about headscarves and hijabs in Islamic women's fashion. Before we get too far into this week's discussion, I want to let everyone know that you do have a pop quiz this week. This will really prepare you for what I'm asking for in your final paper. Um, it's just a simple analysis of a classmate's Instagram post from our class Instagram at World Religions Ferrum. This is due Sunday at 11.59 p.m. You're not going to want to miss this quiz because it's really going to help your grade and I promise it's not going to take too much time. So please get this in as soon and as quickly as possible and this way I can give you some feedback before your final paper. Like I mentioned, we are working on Islam this week. And a couple of things that Stephen Prothrow makes note of in the early parts of the chapter is that he mentions that many Americans, especially many Christian Americans, have never met a Muslim person or someone who grew up in or around Islam. A direct quote from the reading is when Prothrow says, they, meaning people or Americans who've never met a Muslim, see Islam through a veil hung over their eyes centuries ago, denouncing Islam as a religion of violence, its founder, Muhammad, as a man of the sword, and its holy book, the Quran, as a text of wrath. And as we talked about last week with Buddhism and with Christianity, it's really important that we understand the difference between insider and outsider perspective on religion. This would be an instance when the outsider perspective of Islam is skewed or changed by what the media is saying or what the news is telling us every night. These are myths about Islam that we have innately accepted and adapted to without actually doing the proper research or doing proper analysis of what we may already know. So actually over 1 billion people self-identify as Muslims. This actually puts Islam second to Christianity in terms of largest religion, but Islam growth rates are more rapid than Christianity, meaning that Islam could quickly surpass Christianity as the largest religion in the world. Prayer, just like in uh, Judaism and Christianity, is a fundamental component of Islam. I would even argue that prayer is more important in Islam than it is in Christianity and Judaism. In Islam, the core practices for practitioners are outlined by what is called the five pillars. And this is an architectural metaphor. And this means that the central pillar supports the building and the four support pillars frame the outside of the building. The central pillar is the profession of faith, and it is repeated in the call to prayer, and it's said five times daily. So Muslims are expected to pray five times the specific call to prayer or profession of faith. The four support pillars are prayer, charity, fasting, and pilgrimage. So all five of these are really important to the practice and the faith of Muslim adherents. Just like in Christianity, there is a central figure besides God, and that would be Muhammad. Muhammad is attributed as the founder of Islam. He was charismatic, bureaucratic, and revealed the word of the Quran. Muhammad is a model for how Muslims should live their lives. However, unlike Jesus, Muhammad was only ever human, and Islam practitioners and Muslims see him as such. They do not see Muhammad as part God, part human, or a hybrid person like some people might view Jesus. He was fully human and embodied traits that a Muslim would like to carry out into the world themselves. Thinking about our theme for this class, which is religion and material culture, I really wanted to focus on something this week that we might not see in other religions. And specifically in Islam, 
we see this idea of women veiling or wearing hijabs. And there's been a lot of contention about this in many different places, as you might have seen on the media or seen in the news, that the idea of women veiling can be pretty controversial. So Prothero has a section in his book which complements our article reading really well, and he talks about women who are Muslim or women Muslims. And he says that Islam's extreme growth in Europe, including immigration, birth, conversion, and anyone seeking asylum or refugee status, has helped to bolster conversations around head coverings and their place in a European, think, Western society. And remember, categories of Western and Eastern, we don't really like to use. They're not helpful. But I am using them here because it is a way to think about um, ways that Western countries like Europe or America maybe otherize or polarize people who are different than them. So specifically in Europe, I'm talking about it as a Western society because often Europe or Americans who may be unfamiliar with different practices might actually otherize or um, polarize people who are different than them. So although I don't like these dichotomies, I am using them as a, as a teaching tool. So for example, France prohibits the hijab in public schools for reasons of church and state separation. But in Sweden, they allow them headscarves or hijabs as a form of religious liberty. So in two European countries, we have really differing views about women who veil and if they can wear their veils or headscarves or hijabs in public places. So we already have this sort of battle on a country national level about a women's particular ability to do something that is within the bounds of her religion. So Muslim and non-Muslim tensions in Europe are already really high. So the controversy over the hijab creates chasms of otherness in already strained relationships. And we've seen this both in our Buddhism section and our Christianity section, that the more we think about people as different from us and the more we refuse to accept difference or to think about difference, we create these chasms of otherness where we have conversations of us versus them. And really these, these conversations around women being able to veil or have headscarves or wear their hijabs is not something that should be happening on a national level, right? These are these kind of conversations are creating strained relationships between Muslims and between non-Muslims. They're seeing headscarves as oppressive or um, taking away from particular distinctions between church and state in a way that these conversations really shouldn't be having, happening on a national level. So gender has always been a point of contention within and outside of Islam. And again, think about insider and outsider perspective. Have you heard anything or been exposed to anything regarding women in Islam? I know some of the common myths are that women in Islam are, are oppressed or that veils are oppressive or that they don't have any religious freedom or religious liberty, right? So we've, we've heard all of these myths about Islam and about women who are Muslims from the media and from the news and this is going to really point the finger at insider and outsider perspectives. So many non-Muslim dominant countries do see the hijab as a step backwards for women, or they think that it should be banned. And this is really a conversation that should not be happening in non-Muslim circles or non-Muslim dominant countries. The hijab is representative of identity and religious community, although that our quote unquote, Western values or Western feminism is actually playing out or projecting onto the way that we see women Muslims operating in the world. So a quote from Prothro that I'll leave this section with is, many Muslim women have taken their veil off as an expression of their rights as women. Many have chosen to remain veiled as an expression of those same rights. The hijab has also become a symbol of Islamic identity not unlike the kippah, and the kippah is um, what some might call yarmulke or the head covering for Jewish men. So Muslim women are already dealing with ideas of veiling or not to veil. And so these are conversations that can happen in those circles, but we want to be sure that we aren't projecting our values onto another religion. So our article reading this week is from the Journal of Material Religion. So it's it's really firmly situated in sort of the theme of the class. And the authors of this article, Unal and Moore, 
are talking about head scarves or head coverings for Muslim women, specifically in um, European contexts. So this reading, rather than focusing on the debate over force or choice, and again, this is the conversation surrounding are women forced into headscarves or are they choosing for themselves? This is not a conversation we are going to engage in in this course. But they are really interested in, in the materiality of the scarves, the motivation for women to pick fashionable ones, and the way that fabric, form, and fashion can be religious. So the women's attachment to scarves, as Una and Moore discover in their research, goes far beyond style. Women keep scarves that they might never wear because they are memories of family members, of tradition and culture, or of their religious practice and heritage. So they make mention that there are women who have scarves that they don't find particularly attractive, they don't find particularly fashionable, but they'll keep them because they're important to the memory and heritage of their religious community or their family members or their heritage. For many women, wearing a headscarf is both for fashion and for religion. Veiling is a religious practice that demonstrates a women's Islamic identity and their commitment to their religious practice. But the way that women choose scarves, the way that they choose to veil, is also a statement about fashion, how the scarves match their outfits, how the scarves match the seasons. The cut, the color, and the fabric of these scarves all play into what the women do in their daily lives. Do they stay at home? Do they work outside? Do they work inside? Are they working in summer heat or are they working indoors when it's hot? Are they in a climate that's particularly cold or particularly hot? All of these ideas play into the scarves that the women choose and how they choose to express their religious identity and their commitment to their religion. A couple of questions that Unal and Moore ask are, what kinds of effects do particular scarves have on the women who wear them? How do certain scarves affect public perception of women in Islam overall? And how are headscarves different from other forms of dress? And one thing that I'll draw your attention to is that they mentioned that women noticed when they wear particularly attractive or appealing scarves, they believe that people are more or more keen to them and less concerned about their religious commitment to Islam. So think about that moving forward, about how veiling or wearing a scarf might affect or play into which ones a woman chooses. Your Instagram prompt is not as long as it looks here, so bear with me while we talk through a couple of things. So the first two paragraphs are really an explanation about where we're coming from when we're doing this assignment. So for many observant Muslim women, wearing a headscarf or a hijab is a religious practice, a sign of commitment to one's community, and a sign of personal agency. The authors of this piece, Unal and Moors, are not concerned with the debate about force or choice, and neither should we be. When it comes to women wearing headscarves, they are more interested in the kinds of effects that these scarves of different colors, patterns, sizes, fabrics, and styles produce for the women who wear them. As we think about the materiality of religion, consider the headscarves that are shown in this article and the women who collect them. The scarves are not just thought about in terms of design, but how they drape, what they feel like, and the senses that one needs to experience this item of clothing. So your prompt this week is as follows. As if you were also writing about Islamic fashion, find an image of a Muslim or Islamic headscarf and please use an image without a person. There are particular um, parts of Islam that do not want photographs or pictures of people. And so we want to be respectful of that. Using the reading to get some ideas, your Instagram caption should be focused not just on the visuality of the scarf you pick, but on describing the feeling, the colors, if it's warm or not, etc. Be imaginative. If it's a silk scarf, what do Unal and Moore say about silk? Why do they say it's seductive? And cite your readings here because they do say something really specifically about silk. If it's rectangular, what do Unal and Moore say about the shape? Use your imagination to describe the multi-sensory experience of the scarf you've chosen, but back up your ideas from our reading. 
the headings in this article will be really helpful. So think about the scarf that you're seeing. Even though it's online and you can't touch it or feel it, I want your prompt, your Instagram post, to really be descriptive about the scarf, right? We're really thinking about materiality this week, and I want you guys to really lean into that in the way that you talk about these scarves and the way that you talk about why women might pick these over something else. If it's colorful, if it's not colorful, why could they be used? Where could they be used? Think about this, and I'm excited to read what you have to say. Here's an example post from a student in fall one. So read over this and think about the way that they've described texture, color, purpose, cut, form, and fashion. Note that they cited the readings twice actually, and they included a citation from where they got the image. Both of these things are really important in your Instagram post. Please do not forget them. Here are just a few reminders about our Instagram post this week and the topic of Islam. Read over these and think about the ways that we have internalized myths about other cultures and people who are different from us. Please do not involve yourself in a debate over force or choice. As we've talked about in the past, this is not our place to speculate. We are scholars and researchers doing good work, doing good reading, and doing effective and productive research. Your discussion board post this week is really straightforward. Of the four questions that I've listed, you need to answer three of them. Remember that Prothero is offering a new way to study. We are not doing comparative work. It's important to see and recognize differences across religious traditions. You must answer and cite these questions and also let me know which questions you've decided to pick. 